and welcome to Soccer 101. My name is Daryl Grove and joining me today, it's not Taylor Rockwell. It's an expert on German football and 50 plus one. His name is Matt Herman of the Talking Fußball podcast. Matt, hello. Hello, Daryl. So it's really nice to be here. You've, you've been a, a many time, I've lost count, you're a many time guest of the Total Soccer Show, uh, talking Bundesliga. This is Soccer 101. It's very focused on the 50 plus one rule, which I'm sure my guess is a lot of listeners will have heard of it and have a rough idea of what it is, but we're going to get into the details of it today. And I, I kind of just trust that you know all there is to know about 50 plus one. Ooh, you're you're really selling me pretty high right here. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I hope I, I hope I live up to this. Well, let's let's find out, Matt. What exactly is fifty plus one? How would you describe it to someone who had never heard of it? Um, it's basically just a rule that um, you know the German footballing authorities came up with in order to maintain the sort of supremacy of. I don't know, like the sporting side of football versus the business side of football. Basically, it just means that um, investors in a, a, a soccer club can't just take it over and take it in any direction that they want to uh, and just run roughshod over the existing uh, people who are members of the club who get to have a say. So Roman Abramovich, uh, for example, could not just come in and say, I am going to buy Schalke and we're going to do things my way from now on. Yeah, I reckon that uh, in terms of success, if Roman Abramovich had put his money into Schalke all these years ago, probably by this point, Schalke would have uh, ended its title drought. But I think <laughs> that there, there's actually bigger things at stake than, than, than winning football matches and getting into Europe on a regular basis. Um, there's a certain community um, connection that has to be maintained, which... The 50 plus one was the best solution that I think that, that folks in Germany could find at the time that they put it in to, to, to maintain that. I mean, it's probable that it's at some stage they're going to have to come up with another solution because there is some thought that it might not quite pass muster with uh, the European um, European Court of Justice that, that like mediates disputes between you know people in Europe because it's uh, certainly a, a thing that's very unique to Germany. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk later about maybe uh, tweaks or changes to 50 plus one in the future. Um, right now, I want to get into um, exactly what it means. Like, I, th- I feel like people will have heard the phrase. And now if they listen to the show, they understand what it's trying to accomplish. But what exactly is the mechanism? Like, what are we talking about with the 50 plus one? 50 plus one what? Yeah, it's funny because 50 plus one, as we all know, us math whizzes know just means 51 but it actually doesn't really mean that because um an investor in a football club in germany can buy up to you know basically everything short of 50 percent plus one vote um because football clubs in germany are actual clubs they're not just um you know investment vehicles or corporations or anything like that they are like membership associations which are are governed by a certain type of of german law um you know that's how they started that's how they developed obviously as things got bigger over the years there are a lot more commercial interests involved but the sanctity of the sort of club structure of football clubs in germany was was important to a lot of people and in the the 90s when sort of a lot more money and a lot more investors started to get into football someone thought that you know there has to be a way for us to protect this this club structure and basically the solution they came up with was that no matter how much outside investors put into a club the actual members of the club the people who pay their dues and and show up to the the general meetings etc still have to have a controlling interest in what happens in, in the club. It basically means that 50% plus one vote has to remain in the hands of you know the members of the club. So anything short of that is how much money an investor can put in and how much controlling uh, stake an investor can have. But it just means that, that no one – or no one company or one person can ever purchase a controlling interest in, in a football club. And then historically, have investors like been happy to buy like 49.9% of a club um, and put their money in and let the, let the control still go ultimately 
to the 50% plus one vote of, of, the, of the members? Well, it's interesting that you bring up that particular case because in a lot of ways, you know, the, the extreme version of, of uh, you know, testing this out, the 49.9999 whatever percent of a, a club and, and still allowing uh, members to control things hasn't really been tried up until like just a few months ago, actually. Okay. I mean, for the most part, you know, despite the fact that that clubs like uh, Borussia Dortmund, clubs like Schalke, clubs like Bayern Munich have long had investors that they like to call strategic partners. They tend to be corporations. You know, in Bayern's case, things like uh, you know Audi, Adidas, uh, Allianz Insurance. Yeah. In Borussia Dortmund, you have uh, Evonik Energy, uh, Puma. Schalke has Gazprom in, in this role. Most of them have been buying fairly small amounts of these clubs. They've been buying, you know, ten percent stakes, twelve and a half percent stakes, um, you know, eight percent stakes, whatever the case may be. And for these very big, high-profile clubs, it's basically just a way that you can buy yourself. Um, something closer to like a permanent sponsorship of a club. I see. Okay. Yeah. That's why you're you see Gazprom on the front of a Schalke jersey. Absolutely. And, and you know, it basically means that you not only have like um, a little bit of, of voting shares in a club, but like it means that you are, it, it sort of like puts cement over your sponsorship relationship with a club. Right. It means that this is going to be something that continues on into the future until such time as we decide to divest, which is probably never. Um, however, what has happened very recently with um, Hertha, BSA, Hertha Berlin, um, they had been looking for a strategic partner for some time. And they actually found uh, somebody who happened to be, um, you know, a person more than a corporation. I mean, he has a, a holding company called Tenor Holding, but it's basically just this guy called Lars Vintorst, who's a, a an investor. And for whatever reason, he's decided that it's a smart investment to invest in Hertha Berlin as a club. And he's actually bought in just a couple of months ago, all the way up to 49.9% of that club. This is the mm-hmm. first time that, you know, a single investor who wasn't already involved with the club has decided to buy in and buy in at that level. A lot of investors have shied away from investing in German clubs for a long time, or at least investing in that big way because they knew they could never get a controlling stake. And they felt that that put them in too vulnerable a position. So it'll be interesting to see how that particular uh, thing turns out, not only for me because I am a Hector fan, but Uh also to see if, other investors are willing to go down that road. I mean, if things go well for Vinthorst and uh, Hertha, maybe other people are going to go in on, on clubs. If uh, Hertha keep losing games and getting themselves involved in the lower half of the table, maybe even go down, uh, maybe this will be turn out to be a terrible investment mm-hmm. and no one will ever want to do it again. So I know people will be wondering uh, why I haven't brought up uh, Red Bull and RB Leipzig yet. I want to let people know, we're going to get to that. Um, but first, I want to ask about the the two seeming exceptions to the 50 plus one rule that I see from the outside. And that's uh, Wolfsburg, which appears to be owned by Volkswagen, and Bayer Leverkusen, which appears to be owned by Bayer, the pharmaceutical company. So how, how does that setup work? Things are very much as they appear. <laughs> Uh, I have to say these are these clubs are indeed um, they were owned they were set up by these uh, these two concerns two very large companies in Germany two of the larger companies in in the country there was a lot of concern when the fifty plus one rule or or when people were considering what to do about this issue of of you know growing investor interest in football you know making making clubs a little bit more vulnerable to the whims of investors and when, how sorry, you deal when, with these when, clubs, when was yeah? this I think. You said the 90s. What was the specific year that this was happening? This was 1998. Okay. This was around the time when, you know, not so much in Germany, although at that time Germany was experiencing something of a revolution in um, television money and Mm -hmm. the amount of money that was in the game uh, in that respect. But um, Germany hadn't attracted investors very much, partly because of of the idea that that there was nothing to invest in. But... Germany was beginning to look around Europe at places like Italy, at places like England, and seeing how investors were operating. And clubs were sort of trying to sound out 
um, investors. And I think that there was a, a great deal of worry that if you went all the way down the road, um, that perhaps uh, a club, I don't know, like uh, AC Milan or Inter Milan or you know Manchester United, who, who were putting themselves on the stock market around that time, that it would just create a lot of vulnerability for these you know football clubs. And so German football authorities kind of wanted to nip it in the bud before it really even got off the ground. So to the example of uh, Wolfsburg and Bayer, um, how, how does that work? Yeah, I mean – Basically, the, the the problem in a lot of people's minds was how do we sort of put the kibosh on this without uh, then saying Leverkusen and Wolfsburg, you're banned as well, because the obvious uh, fact was that ever since those clubs were founded, the, the corporations with whom they're so strongly associated actually have a controlling ownership stake. What they decided to do was say that if – a, a person or corporate entity had had 20 years of support slash relationship for a club, if they had invested for uh, 20 years, that they were allowed to then um, go ahead and buy a controlling stake if the membership uh, voted to allow them to do so. Uh-huh. Um, this was kind of a weird loophole to go with and it has been one that actually proved a little bit thorny down the road when you know other people got to that 20 year mark um but that was how they decided to do it and and you know in the case of those two clubs they actually call this loophole the the lex leverkusen the, the leverkusen law uh because it was basically put in place to let leverkusen stay in the league and keep their license So was Wolfsburg and Volkswagen the same situation at the same time and it just happened to be named after Leverkusen or did the uh, Volkswagen-Wolfsburg relationship mature to the 20-year point after 1998? No, no. Leverkusen was just simply a a more prominent club at the time. Um, Wolfsburg, if I'm not mistaken, might even have been in the second division uh, in the late 90s and just weren't really at the forefront of people's minds. But yeah, it's been around Wolfsburg, I think – was started around the same time that, you know, Volkswagen started making cars there back in the, you know, 40s or something like that. So it's always been been a VW club. Are there any um, relationships that have matured to the 20-year point and it's become um, an issue? Um, well, Dietmar Hopp, uh, who is the de facto owner of Hoffenheim, was given that status in uh, 2011, I believe, because he had had, I mean, he was a member of that club for a long time. He had played for Hoffenheim as a kid and had invested in the club, helping them with facilities and stuff on a, on a small level because it was a small club in the nineties. Uh, so he was allowed to, you know, invest in, in a bigger way. But the more controversial instance was in the case of uh, Hanover 96's uh, owner, a guy called Martin Kind, who, um, has been super instrumental in raising that club's status up to, you know, being a mostly first division, sometimes second division club. I mean, that was a a club that had been for most of its history, a second division club and hadn't spent a lot of time in the first division before he, he got his money involved. And I think in 27 or 18, he became eligible to, you know, become a, a majority investor. Um, and he basically had a decision to make. He could either go to the membership of Hanover 96, which is to say the fans in some way, and say, hey, I've been at this for 20 years. Do you want to let me become the majority owner? And if I become the majority owner, I will put even more money into this club. Or he could wait on that because he might not have won that vote and try and see what would happen with the league in terms of the validity of the 50 plus one rule for the whole league going forward. And he decided that the the second path was the way he wanted to go um, because he didn't want to lose face by going to the membership and losing that vote, which he might well have done because they were not in the best of places at the time. I see. Today's show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Not owned by, sponsored by ExpressVPN. We have our own 50 plus one rule on Soccer 101. But I am happy to endorse ExpressVPN. I've tried many other VPN providers. I can honestly say that ExpressVPN is the best I've ever used. 
ExpressVPN lets you spoof your location. So you can appear to be in the UK or Taiwan or Germany and have access to all the content on the internet that is geo-restricted to those places. With your regular US IP, there's a lot of stuff you would not be able to see. The ExpressVPN app works for your computer, your mobile, any digital media players as well, like Fire TV or Apple TV or Roku, whatever it is that you use. The other aspect of ExpressVPN is that it lets you keep all your network data encrypted, secure and safe. It is the fastest VPN I've tried, costs around $8 a month and comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you want to access content from around the world and protect your online activity today, you can get three months free at expressvpn.com slash soccer. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash soccer for three months free with a one-year package. Visit expressvpn.com slash soccer to learn more. And now we come to the example of the Austrian energy drink company um, who... Had, did really take over and rename a team from Leipzig RB Leipzig. But they somehow did it within the structure of 50 plus one. And I am fascinated by how they managed to do that. So could, are you able to explain to me and to our listeners, how did Red Bull manage to uh, create RB Leipzig while 50 plus one was in effect? It was really complicated, and they had to take a really weird path towards that. Um, they basically found a very small club called SSV Makranstadt, a club that you know played in the state of Saxony but were not a Leipzig club, just sort of nearby. And they bought the club or bought the club's license. Uh, this was something that the club, I, I suppose, for whatever reason, was was open to the idea of, of Red Bull uh, buying them or, or taking a controlling stake in, in terms of, you know, allowing them to add members and um, change the name. First, they tried to change the name to uh, Red Bull Leipzig, which the German football authorities didn't like. So they said, well, we'll change the name to Rasenballsport Leipzig. Um, as you can hear, there is an R and a B in there. <laughs> it means, you know, lawn ball sports. Uh, Leipzig. And um, they basically had to go from the bottom all the way to the top by sort of overspending for whatever league level they were at. And all the while, they sort of redrew the club's uh, sort of membership rules to where by the time they got into the top couple of tiers, the number of members of the club had shrunk to something like 11, 12. And most German clubs, to become a member, it costs anywhere from maybe $50 to maybe as much as $75 a year. So it's not not a nothing investment, but it's, it's something that most folks who really are motivated to become members can't afford. And the membership fee to become a member of RB Leipzig was something over like $1,000. So unless you were very, very, very interested in German football governance and had the money to spend, the money to spare, to like make a point about how this club was uh, subverting the 50 plus one rule, you're probably just going to you know grumble about it from the outside rather than actually be, buy a, a membership. So anytime there was any sort of... Um, membership vote uh trying to decide anything the club would do all the members or almost all the members were red bull employees like red bull executives who had a thousand dollars to spend on this and basically we're going to tow the party line uh so this was how they were able to get around the fact that you know there was ostensibly no place for a corporate owner because it was just a situation that the membership's interests and the membership's composition happened to align almost exactly with the corporation's uh, interests and composition. I see. So is it possible for this to happen again? Could um, Carabao, or it doesn't have to be an energy drink, but any, any other company, could they take a small team somewhere and do the same thing to the membership rules and, and take it over? Yeah, I think I think – there hasn't really been 
any um, there hasn't been any move to prevent this same situation from from happening again. Um, I would find it pretty unlikely for it to happen again, um, in part because the project that Red Bull has undertaken is is a really expensive and you know hugely time consuming and consuming in 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 terms of uh, manpower, in terms of know-how, in terms of sort of just focus. And I don't think a lot of companies are really interested in that. Um, Basically, Red Bull were willing to devote a decade or more and hundreds of millions of euros to this project, which thus far, I mean, they have raised the profile of the brand. They have played some good football. They've attracted some interesting players. They've probably made some money by, you know, selling players because they've had a couple of big, big ticket players leave, guys like Nabi Keita, et cetera. But, like, the tangible success in terms of titles or, um, you know, other honors is not that big. And I think that a lot of other, other individuals or a lot of companies would probably want to see a bigger or different sort of payoff. Right. Or would not be patient enough to want to do it, uh, but ostensibly, why not? Why care about? Get on it. Would it be much much harder to do it at a team that's already really big? Like, was it easier to do it because the original um, Saxony team was very very small? Yes, of course, of course. Um, I think there have been there have definitely been um, investors who have wanted to invest in clubs but thought that between the sort of regulatory atmosphere with 50 plus one or the fact that um, they have to sort of stay on the membership's good side for a really long time, for basically 20 years, which is almost an impossible thing to do, have just thought that, you know, getting involved in a big club is something that would not be possible. And I think that in some ways 50 plus one was, was, meant to do exactly that was meant to dissuade people from trying to run roughshod over the interests of a lot of these clubs, which have tens of thousands of members who have lifelong commitments to these clubs. And I think in that respect, that's, that's 50 plus one working properly. Can I assume that 50 plus one is mostly popular with football fans, Bundesliga fans? Yeah. Oh yeah. It is hugely popular. Um, there was, I mean, in part, driven by the, the wishes of Martin Kind, this um, Hanover 96 investor, and in part by you know a somewhat more lukewarm interest on the part of a few other clubs. Uh, 50 plus one was actually brought up for a vote or a sort of, you know, basically what was brought up for a vote is was, should we take another look at this thing? Should we tweak it? Should we get rid of it? And this happened in... I guess the spring of 2018 and fans really, really mobilized in a big way to, you know, let the investors and, um, you know, club boards know in, in no uncertain terms that they really, really thought that the 50 plus one rule was good and that it was doing what it was meant to do. And that in terms of, of what fans want out of football, uh, which is reasonably priced tickets, which is, Uh, a a degree of responsiveness on the part of owners. The fact that this is a somewhat less, you know, customer vendor relationship, which is what exists in a lot of other countries, especially England, Mm -hmm. that they didn't want any part of that, that they wanted things to stay as it was. And in the end, the people running the clubs listened to them and they voted to, you know, stick with it. I think they're probably going to wait in, in some ways, even the people who as uh, executives might want to see a different, investment model they're probably going to wait for their hand to be forced by a court before they uh, do anything to this rule because basically fans would revolt so if there is a court ruling that maybe overturns it or if there's a future where and I'm, i'm imagining a distant future where maybe it's seen that bundesliga teams are falling behind other big european teams like suddenly they're not competitive in the champions league because all the other big teams are owned by billionaire billionaires or oil funds or <laughs> essentially nations who are spending their their money um what are the possibilities for changing 50 plus one in the future yeah that's really tricky um i don't think many people have proposed um many good alternatives in part because the the sort of social pressure to um 
stick with 50 plus one is is really strong and a lot of people i think just would rather keep their mouth shut and not try and rock the boat rather than than try and and you know speak out against it even in in somewhat um hedged terms Mm -hmm. um i think the second point that you brought up about you know what what could get rid of it is the one that that is the one that's being sort of muted by the uh, angry response from from fans, which is to say, Germany's relative underperformance in Europe or or feeling of disadvantage when it comes to competing on the transfer market. I mean that that's already a reality. Um, other than Bayern Munich, basically no club um, has had consistent success in Europe over the last you know seven or eight years. I mean we saw of course Dortmund get to the final against Bayern back in 2013, but that kind of a deep run by a club other than Bayern has been super, super seldom. I mean, the fact that uh, Eintracht made it to the semifinal of the Europa League last year felt like a miracle. But it's also the Europa League where the scale <laughs> of things was was uh, a little smaller. But it, it, even in that respect, watching those games, seeing Eintracht overperform really inspired a lot of people. And to see them then basically fall in the semifinal to an English team who doesn't even care about the Europa League and in some ways just sort of, you know, set out their multi-hundred million euro team, or, or I guess it's pounds in this case, <laughs> um, team of, of, of players to just, you know, get past them. It, it just felt, it felt bad. It felt bad. Was it was it Chelsea or Arsenal that beat Eintracht? I believe it was Chelsea. Oh, so the irony of the Abramovich yeah, owned Chelsea, yeah. It really did. It really did. I mean, is there is there a way to somehow have fifty plus one and it's still majority owned by the uh I'm sorry, what's the correct phrase? The the association or the group or the members owned by the members, but encourage investment. Can you see an alternative? Well, I think most clubs are already trying. Most clubs are already trying to get creative with it. Um, many of them have sort of spun off. They call it the the licensed game department or something like that. Like, I, it's it's. I, I don't know exactly how to translate it into English. Um, it's basically that the club is an entity which is governed as a club, but then like the actual professional operations of the first team. Um, or the, you know, the sort of, the part that actually runs the football club in terms of what you see on the pitch in professional football is in some ways a separate entity. It's still, it's like a, it's like a daughter company or something like that, but it actually has a, a degree of financial independence. Um, nobody has tried to push that to the point where, you know, they're, they're messing with, with 50 plus one in terms of, you know, getting the, uh, the the professional team part away from the control of the club, but there's definitely some uh, I don't know in terms of like organizational uh, efficiency. There's definitely been moves to separate the professional operations of a club from the sort of somewhat more complicated uh, voting mechanisms of a multi-thousand member club entity understood oh i have one last question just about how things work um the votes how do the votes work when it's thousands of people like is it in person ballots is it like online how does how is it a show of hands in a gigantic stadium like how how do they do the votes with all those members it tends to be in person like for example i i'm a member of of hertha bsc and if i want to vote i actually have to go to the annual general meeting and do that I have not actually been able to do it. I've either been out of town or been working at the times when the the general meeting has happened. So I haven't gotten to vote. But there is definitely no um, there's no online mechanism, at least for the club that I'm a, I'm part of. I think that it is at a lot of clubs tends to be a yay nay situation. But if there is any question of a vote being um, any closer, then it becomes an individual, you know, paper ballot or electronic uh, voting situation where they actually 
actually tally up votes individually from the people who were there in person. I see. Okay, I feel like I've gotten a lot of information from you about 50 plus one and how it all works. I think the smart question to end with would be, is there anything about 50 plus one that I haven't asked you about that is particularly important? Whew. I'm trying to get like I'm trying to complete the set yeah. here and make sure I've got a full picture for our listeners. The thing that's interesting about the 50 plus one rule is that it has lasted as long as it has, and that at some stage it probably is going to be overturned. Um, no one has thus far put it up for a sustained, like well-funded, um, well-founded legal challenge. But a lot of people who are involved in sports governance in Europe um, think that if someone did do that, that it would probably be um, nullified by some sort of European court. Um, so I think it's actually really important for German football, if they really want to sort of maintain the character of, um, I don't know, relationship to community and relationship to existing stakeholders and sort of prevent investors from being able to alter or, or you know, get rid of those relationships. German football actually really needs to come up with another one, come up with a different rule that would withstand a legal challenge. And I don't think that anyone has come up with uh, anything very satisfying there. Um, it's it, it just seems dangerous to me that they um, are basically relying on the reluctance of rich people to make uh, a, a legal crusade against it. Because if someone ever does that, I think that it would probably find it really hard to, to, to stick around. So I, I, I hope that someone comes up with a new mechanism that can keep things more or less the way they are. All right. That is a great closing thought. Thank you, Matt Herman. Um, if people want to hear more from you, obviously the place to go is Talking Fussball. Is that correct? Talking Fussball. That's it. So find that wherever you're listening to this podcast, search for Talking Fussball and you will find the Bundesliga podcast, Talking Fussball. And you'll get probably not the same level of information about uh, each topic um, because we have spent 45 minutes on one topic here. Yeah, what are we doing here? <laughs> this is sort of like a, it's supposed to be like a, a document that now anyone who wants to hear about 50 plus one, they can, they can really get all the details in their ears all in one place. Would you mind telling our listeners about Talking Fussball though? What, what do you guys do there? Yeah, Talking Fußball is basically a, a way for folks who love the Bundesliga to come and listen to people uh, talking about every single match day, what happened in the match day, what are the main stories from the match day, who is up, who's down, what coaches are uh, in, what coaches are out, uh, and, and, you know, do that with a relatively um, low-key and relatively fun, funny uh, sort of outlook. It's not a life or death uh, football analysis situation. <laughs> we also have another podcast on on you know Thursdays, which is all about Bundesliga fantasy. So if you're into fantasy and you're into the Bundesliga flavor of it, it's absolutely the best place to go. And also just to sort of set yourself up, get ready for each match day, because you know sometimes fantasy is the best way to learn who's hurt, who's not, who's going to start, who, who who's uh, you know probably on the bench and uh for the folks who, who who need their points that's the way that that they they can find that out and fantasy you own a hundred percent of your team 110 <laughs> <110%. laughs> percent. so he has been matt herman i'm daryl grove and you've been listening to soccer 101 thank you for listening to soccer 101 <laughs>